Right. I'm going to speak on the Philadelphia church. All right. Now, Philadelphia was one of the seven churches in Asia that Jesus spoke to and highlighted some of their characteristics. Some of them, he had a rebuke, like Laodicea. They really were a lukewarm, lukewarm church. And he said, if you don't repent, I'll come and spew you out of my mouth. That's pretty uh, down the line, isn't it? He said to the Ephesus church, if you don't keep your first love, you should be keeping your first love. You should be on fire for me. You should be ablaze with me and my love. But when he comes to the church at Philadelphia, he doesn't rebuke them. He has just commendation towards them. So that's good news, isn't it? <laughs> I wonder, as he looks down at us at Sandy Hill, I wonder what he says. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I trust that it will be some good things, as well as perhaps not so good things. But anyway, that's the Lord for you. So there we are, those churches were in Asia. And uh, where did it get its name from? Well, it got its name from Attalus the second. Believe it or not, we don't need to worry about him. It's all in the history. But his name was turned and changed to Philadelphus. Fancy having a name called Philadelphus. <laughs> Anyway, that's by and by. And that meaning of that name is love of my brother. Can you see something here? Those that understand a little bit about Greek, if you do, I don't know much, but I only pick up words that I read and understand from other people. <laughs> anyway, in the Greek language, there are several words for love. There's agape love, which is the love of Christ, which we love one another, don't we? In Christ Jesus. But there's also a brotherly love, or a natural love, and that word is filio. And so I think Philadelphia got its name from that word filio, because Attalus II loved his brother. Okay, changing the scene a bit. Where was its position? Well, it was fortunate that um, it was a strategic church because it was on a crossroads. There were two roads and they built the church somewhere near those crossroads. And those, those roads were the trade routes that were going right over Asia. Some even eventually went up to Russia and into China. And all the merchants used to bring their goods and their perfumes and their spices. That's probably where the first curry was made, <laughs> using some of these um, different merchants along the trade routes. And uh, what did God say to them through Jesus Christ? Well, he says in verse 7, These things, he who is holy and is true, and it's worth stopping there for a bit and just to highlight who Jesus was. He was holy and he was true. Sometimes you don't always find people giving true respect to the Lord Jesus Christ. But he's holy. God is holy. That's why the word of God says, be ye holy, because he is holy. And so holiness should shape our lives because God is holy. Yeah? His truth. In fact, the Bible says he's the way, the truth, and the life. And so we need to take note of what it says there. Holy and true. Yes, he's our friend. Yes, he's our saviour. Yes, he's our Lord. 
And you can look at all the names of Jesus and get an overall view of what he's like. But he is holy and true. And he said to this church, I've got the key of David. He who opens, nobody's going to shut the door. And if I shut the door, nobody is going to open it. Wow, that's powerful stuff, isn't it? This church had an open door. Hallelujah. God was blessing that church. He had an opportunity to shine for Jesus and to a bit be a witness and preach the gospel on those trade routes, those people that came in. You know something? I believe God has given to us here, in a sense, an open door. I believe that is something that's prophetic for this church. God has opened the door and we've got to go through it and take up all the opportunities that God gives us to preach the gospel, to share our faith, to declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe that we've got an open door to this area. I believe God is going to move by his spirit. He's got big plans for this church. We might be small at the moment, but I believe that this church here was small. It doesn't say how big it was numerically, but it says in one of the verses that you have little strength. And so this church here, though it was perhaps lacking in strength, but what strength it had, they turned it over to Jesus Christ and they were able to move forward in his strength. Okay? And that's what makes all the difference, to move forward in the strength of the Lord. It's not by might, neither is it by power, but it's by his spirit, says the Lord of hosts. That's a word from Zechariah chapter 4. And so we need the power of God in order to get the job done. I was looking at a verse of scripture the other day from Mark 15, chapter, uh, chapter 15, verse 20, and it says that they went out to serve the Lord, they preached the gospel, and it says the Lord working with them. Isn't that wonderful? You see, we don't have to do it on our own. If we do it in our own strength, we will fail miserably. But if we do it in the power of God and the strength that God gives us, Him working with us, we're going to see fruit. Amen? I long to see fruit. I long to see revival. I've longed, it's been my prayer for 50 odd years plus to see revival. I haven't seen it yet. I've seen moves of God, but I haven't seen real revival. Will revival come? I know for a fact that we're going to see a mighty harvest reaped towards the end of the age. And the end of the age, I believe, is getting closer and closer and closer. We're going to see many come into the kingdom. And we've all got a work to do. We have a destiny over our lives. There's a destiny over your life. Whether you realise it or not, whether you've discovered it or not, there's a destiny. There's a destiny over my life. And I pray and trust that God will keep me in my latter years strong and fit and healthy and Glenn is saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I can fulfill it to the end, until the rapture comes. Yes, I always imagine myself not dying, but going up to be with Jesus in the rapture. <laughs> That's my personal view. Mm. Hallelujah. He's got the keys. He's got the door and he keeps it open and he's keeping it open for us 
Even though there's opposition, even though Satan would come along and try to snuff us out and to turn off the light in our hearts, right? God is with us. And we've got to believe that. And we've got to believe that with all of our hearts, that whatever oppositions that we might face personally or as a church, we can push through because Jesus is the head of his church and he says the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen? Amen. That's a promise. And so in God we have the victory. Yes? We triumph through Christ Jesus our Lord. And as we build with him, we will see success. I'm trying to sow seeds of positiveness this morning into our hearts here at Sandy Hill to believe God for the vision to be fulfilled. Right? There's an open door and we've got to go through it irrespective of the oppositions and the setbacks that we have. Verse 8, it says, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door that no one can shut it, for you have little strength. I mentioned that before. What are some of these characteristics that Jesus highlighted here? What well, in verse 8, we have really two. He says, you've kept my word. In other words, you've been faithful. And this Philadelphian church here is known as the faithful church. Even though they were weak, perhaps, or I should say a little strength, they didn't have a lot of strength, but God kept them together. <laughs> he kept them together. He was Lord over their lives. And so long as they worshipped him, so long as they put him first, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. They had that attitude. They put Jesus first. They kept his word. They were faithful. Are you faithful? I trust that you are. I keep praying for myself and say, Lord, please keep me faithful in these dark and end days that we're living in. Keep me faithful. Keep me looking to you, the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen. And then he says, you have not denied my name. Hmm. It's easy to go and hide in the corner, isn't it? It's easy to dig a hole and bury yourself and get away from it all. <coughs> it's easy not to serve God. But we can't because there's something in us. There's a fire burning in our hearts. We want to keep the word of God burning because we don't want to deny him. Do you know Jeremiah? He was an Old Testament prophet. He was called by God. And just fancy this for a moment. God knew him before he was ever born. And God ordained him to be a prophet before he was ever born. That's amazing, isn't it? And so, that's God for you. He sees the end from the beginning, and he sees the beginning from the end. Because he's got all knowledge, all understanding. And he saw Jeremiah even before he was born, and he ordained him to be a prophet. And he didn't really have a very good start. People were against him. <coughs> they didn't like the word of God. They didn't like what he was saying. But on one occasion, he said, the word of God in me, I can't keep silent. It's like a fire in my bones. I've got to proclaim the word of God to the people. I can't do anything other. I've got to do it. It's a fire burning within me. And that's what we need, I believe, 
a bit of fire from the Holy Spirit and the Word of God in our lives to keep us on track and on fire to shed the light of God, the gospel to this world. Yes. They didn't deny his name. Do you know something? The word of God says, Jesus said this, if you deny me, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. That's pretty tough going, isn't it? That's, that's the words of Jesus. So we've got to keep him focused in our lives and to share him with others. Now also they had a bit of opposition. Look at verse 9. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie indeed. I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. <coughs> In other words, there was deception. People probably came into that church at Philadelphia and pretended to be something that they weren't. They tried to pull the wall over people's eyes. But you see, the Bible says, by their fruits you shall know them. Okay? We've got to be careful and be aware of deception. We've got to make sure that we are discerning people, that we stay close to the Lord. Because there's always the fake and there's always the genuine. We want genuine people, don't we, to come and build with us here at Sandy Hill. We don't want fake people that as a form of religion that say they are Jews but they're not because they lie. Deception. Deception. And God will give us that discernment in the future. Hallelujah. God was saying here, I'll make them come and worship at your feet. <laughs> Only God can do that. Yes. But there was a reward. Verse 10, look at this here. Because you have kept my command to persevere. So there's another characteristic. They were a persevering church. They kept at it. They didn't give up. Even though they were tired, they still got up. They still served. Even though they thought, oh, I'm going to leave it to somebody else to do it. They carried on again. They got some energy from the Lord and they persevered and they pushed through. They pushed through the difficulties. They kept at it. And God says, I'm going to reward you for your perseverance. Isn't that what it's like as Christians? The Bible says that we have to run the race. In Hebrews, uh, whatever it is, chapter 12, I think it is. We've got to run the race. We've got to cast off all the obstacles, the sins that might trip us up and entangle us. And we've got to run the race with patience. And we've got to run until we see the finishing line, the post in sight. Yes. Keep at it. Serve God right down to the end. Don't be tempted halfway through and say, oh, oh another problem. Oh, another difficulty. Oh dear, the race seems to get worse and worse. I'm going to back out. I'm going to sit down by the sideline and have a drink and I'm going to just go to sleep. We can't do that because we're living in days. We've got to redeem the time because the days are evil. That's what the word of God says. And so we've got to push through. But Jesus here, and I think verse 10, is a little gem. It's a nugget of gold, I think, in the scriptures. It says here, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who are dwelling on the earth. What's all that about? Remember, Jesus was, was given this word 
I don't know what the century might have been. It might have been in the early part of the, the first century when he spoke to these churches in Asia. But here he promises to keep them from the trial that is coming upon the whole world. I believe here we have a picture of the, of the rapture of Jesus when Jesus comes in the air to receive the saints of God and takes them home to be with him. Now, I know there's a lot of people that have different ideas, different doctrines, of whether we go through the tribulation or whether we uh, go midway through the tribulation. I personally believe that we will not go through the tribulation. That's what I believe in all my heart. I've, I've, I've studied the word of God and I've listened to other people. I've weighed up doctrine. But you see, God has not appointed us to tribulation. He hasn't appointed us to wrath. If you read the book of Revelation, it sounds pretty awful to be lingering in this world. Yeah? Do you really think, as God loves us, died for us on the cross, that he's going to subject us to seven years of trial and temptation and tribulation. It gets worse and worse as you go through the, the book of Revelation. Yes, he's coming in chapter 19 <laughs> to actually physically come to this earth. But you see, Jesus gives this promise here to these people. Because you've persevered, because you've kept my word, because you haven't denied my name, I give you this reward. I will keep you from the hour of temptation. In the Greek, it simply means, I'll take you from this world. I'll take you. Hallelujah. He'll snatch us one day from the world and take us home to be with him in heaven. You see, while the world has seven years of tribulation, we will be in heaven in seven years where we've got to be judged because we can't reign with Christ and first until we've been judged. And that judgment isn't because of sin, because Jesus dealt with that on the cross. It's about giving rewards. It's about being before the Lord and giving an account of our lives to him. Yes. Seven years. Seven years. Worshipping him. The marriage supper of the Lamb. Did you know the bridegroom is coming back for his bride? Yeah. And did you know in Jewish tradition that that bridegroom when he had permission from his father to go and get the bride, I'm looking at Matthew 25, thinking of that in my mind, of the, of the ten virgins, he came and he took the bride back to his father's house. Hallelujah. And he was there for seven weeks, which I believe represents seven years also. Anyway, that's a bit of typology for you. But that was the promise. And then he says in verse 11, just to highlight it all, behold, I am coming soon. I'm coming quickly. Well, if he said that all those many, many, many years ago, what does it mean to us now? Well, he's still coming quickly. <laughs> we don't know the day or the hour, but we can know something of the, of the era in which we're living in. We're not that daft, are we? God gives us a little bit of up top grey matter to work things out that this world isn't the world that we knew 50 years ago. It's getting darker and darker. There's sin in this world. There's evil. There's things being done today in schools that would never be thought of years ago. There's abortion that's going on. For all those many, many years from the, when was it, from the 60s. There's all these things. And, and, and God 
has got to judge. That's why the trial is coming on the earth. That's why tribulation has to come. You see, he did it in Noah's day. He sent the flood. But before the flood came, Noah and his family went in the ark and they were saved. What about Lot? You know, he settled in Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> but you know, God was going to judge Sodom and Gomorrah. But before he sent that judgment, he sent an angel. And he said to Lot, and he said, come on out. I can't do anything yet until you're out. That's a picture of getting us out. God will not subject us to judgment. <laughs> as soon as they went out, fire and brimstone fell down in that, on that valley of uh, Zor, of Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes, we have principles in the Bible that God is with us and he will take us home. Yes. And so he says, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have that no one takes your crown. All right? My word to you is this. Don't fall at the last step of the finishing line of the race. Keep going. Keep going. Keep close to the Lord in these days. Keep his word. Don't deny his name. Keep moving ahead. Don't let anybody take your crown. Don't get robbed. The enemy is a thief and a liar. He's a robber and he steals and he wants to destroy us and take away from us. He's not having us because Christ is praying for his church. He's praying for you and he's praying for me and he's praying for Sandy Hill Baptist Church here that we will not fail but we will push through in his will and his purpose. Amen? Amen? That's what God is doing. He's on our side. Sometimes we forget that. The devil is our arch enemy and he's not going to win. Read the end of the Bible and you'll discover he gets thrown in the end into the lake of fire. The Antichrist, the false prophet and Satan himself end up. Yes. We're on the winning side. Hallelujah. And because this church, though they were small in strength, small in numbers, no doubt, they persevered. And in verses 12, to the end, he promises those rewards. And I'll let you work them all out. My God, he shall go out and no more. I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. I find that amazing that Jesus spoke to this Philadelphian church about what would happen right at the end of the age in Revelation 20, is it 21? Yeah? When the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven and God then makes his abode and stays on the new heaven and the new earth with his people. And that's where we're going to dwell for eternity in the new Jerusalem. And I'm amazed that Jesus revealed that to these people at Philadelphia. He says, that's going to be your reward. If you're faithful, if you persevere, if you keep my word and don't deny my name, you'll end up one day in the new Jerusalem. You see, God is going to create a new heaven and a new earth. Did you know that? One day, this earth will not be the same as it is today. And the heavens will not be the same as it is today. It's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. You won't need the sun to keep you warm. You won't need light so we don't group in the darkness because there won't be any darkness there. In the new Jerusalem, God is the light. <laughs> Amen. He is. He's the light and he will shine forevermore. 
upon our lives. Praise the Lord. And that was one of the rewards that God, that Jesus said to this church. And he says there also, he says, which comes down from heaven, and my God, and I will write on him my new name. Now, if you said to me, well, what's that new name? I'd say, I don't know. Do you know? I don't know what that new name is. It's, it hasn't been revealed. That's why it's new when he writes it on our, our forehead, no doubt. But we have a new name. <coughs> we probably have his name. <laughs> but that was the reward. A new name. A place in the new Jerusalem. And he says, lastly, in verse 13, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And we've got to keep our ear open to the voice of God in these days. And we want his will to be done. We want him to speak to us. And we want to be led in truth and in righteousness. He wants us to be discerning. The tribe of Ishakar had understanding of the days in which they lived in. That's Old Testament. How much more do we in these end days as Christians need to discern what the will of God is? And I would encourage you to read the word of God. Get to know the word of God. Get to understand something of what is going on or will go on in this world for seven years is judgment time for the world and then Jesus will come at the end ride it on a white horse and it says also his saints with him and I put my hand up and say I'm a saint only because of Jesus <laughs> we will come with him to set up his kingdom on this earth for a thousand years he will reign with a rod of iron until after that for a short space of time, the devil will be released again. And I haven't got the answer to that. That's one of the questions I'm going to ask the Lord when I get back to heaven, home to heaven. <laughs> Why did he get released for a short period of time and deceive the world when you had him already locked up? <laughs> Why? <laughs> I don't know. But in the end, he has his final destiny in the lake of fire. So, I trust that this has been illuminating to you. I trust that this has been challenging to you. That we need to live our lives fully for God in these end days. Don't compromise. Don't give up. Keep persevering. Keep running the race that is set before us because Jesus is the author and finisher of the faith. Hallelujah. Can we close our eyes for a minute? I feel that there's a response needed this morning. And I want you to make that response in your own heart without any showing of hands or coming to the front. That you would really rededicate your life afresh to the Lord, the Lord of his church. And be prepared to give everything over to him. To make him Lord a master of your life that you will serve him faithfully to the end that you will keep the faith you will do all that you can to witness to serve him to be a light in this dark world basically to shine for Jesus to love one another, to love 
your fellow Christian. Not just in filio love, but in agape love. That you'll give your life afresh to the Lord. And all the questions that you haven't got answered, you would surrender them to the Lord. And I believe he will show you in due time what those answers should be. But keep faithful. Keep on fire. Keep serving. And I believe that God will give you the strength that you need to live in these end days for his glory. Amen. Amen.